hadn't sung in a long, long time. So, no, I ain't going to talk about that because you hadn't preached it yet. <laughs> I might talk about you later, though, but probably not. It's not a good thing to do. 532. We're saying the first and third verse, and then 637. And we'll sing the first and last verse of it also. <clears throat> 532. You'll have to use your books because I don't think the screen, well, it works, but it's not working today. First and third verse. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O oh, His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels in glory. Drink thine honor, give to His holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. In his arms he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever and awful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer, heavenly portals, loud with those honors ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him. Ever in joyful song. Number 637. We'll do first and last verses on it too. And then Rick will be up to introduce the speaker. 637. If I walk in the pathway of duty, if I work till the close of the day, I shall see the great King in His beauty. When I've gone the last mile of the way, when I've gone the last mile of the the close of the day, and I know there are joys that await me when I've gone the last mile of the way, and if I have earnestly striven, and have tried all his will to obey. Twilling eyes saw the rapture of heaven when I've gone the last mile of the way. When I've gone the last mile of the the close of the day, and I know there are joys that await me when I've gone the last mile of the
pleased to have with us tonight Butch Jones, who's uh, preached here before, and we're looking forward to hearing from him again. Butch has been preaching the gospel for 49 years. He says he's completed 40 years with the LJ Church of Christ, February the 2nd, 2020. He's currently preaching at Hiawassee, and he was raised in the Blue Ridge congregation and was part of the first graduating class at GACS in 1970. He attended Alabama Christian College, which is now Faulkner University, and he um, <clears throat> attended Alabama Christian School of Religion, which is now Ambridge University. He's married to an elder's daughter from Alexander City, Alabama, Susan Anderson. And they're coming up on their 49th anniversary, and she's with us here tonight. That's great. They have two children, Jenny Thompson from Birmingham, Alabama, and Brandon Jones in L.A.J. Uh, they have four grandchildren, Dasher Thompson, Eddie Jones, Ivy Thompson, and Brantley Jones. So it sounds like they took turns. He enjoys camping, hiking, hunting, and fishing. In that order? pretty much. We're really looking forward to hearing from Butch tonight from the Word of God, but let's open with a prayer. Our gracious Lord, we come before you thanking you for being our God and thanking you for the way you love us and care for us and, and bless our lives. Father, we bring glory and honor to your name. We thank you for Jesus, for his sacrifice for us, for the example he set before us and for his life. Father, we ask you to look down upon us and guide us as we study from your word tonight, when we study from the, the book of Luke. Father, we ask you to guide our hearts and minds and that we truly grow by being here tonight and that we, we become stronger and stronger ambassadors for you each and every time we come together. Be with us and guide us. Forgive us when we fail you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. That's uh, so good to be with you. A little stressed. Uh, the uh, folk in Hiawassee are Zooming tonight, and uh, so they'll be joining us. And uh, we uh, are a small group up in the mountains, and you know, a lot of people have been coming to the mountains, uh, and I understand why after today. Uh, the uh, traffic was uh, terrible getting here, and some of you fight that all the time. So when, when you get tired of the traffic and you want to get out of it, come on up to Hiawassee. We need you. Uh, but uh, elders, I hope you'll allow me to do that. It's a great mission work, and I've enjoyed it, I, uh, especially... Uh, Enjoyed the LJ work when you when they put up with the preacher for 40 years, you know something's got to be going on, and uh, many of you have been there, and it's good to see old friends tonight. And uh, if you've not met me in the past, I hope that we'll get an opportunity to talk just a little bit tonight. I really appreciate uh, the privilege of coming back to Woodstock. Uh, it's uh, it's been a few years since I've been here, and uh, it's always a joy to come. And I do hope we can visit. Uh, you know, I, my younger work was up in Macedonia in Fanning County between Blue Ridge and McKaysville. And uh, your secretary, Ellen, and her family were one of the families of the church. So uh, when, I, when I need to call the office or when I need to talk to someone here at Woodstock, I know who's going to answer the phone. And it's a joy to, uh, to have Ellen. She's a good worker. Uh, that comes from a great family. And I just hope that uh, uh, she and Mary will be here with you a long time. You know, the book of Luke, uh, I mentioned to uh, someone a moment ago that week before last, I was in, in Ringo, Georgia. They had me talk on the book of Romans. And I talked just as fast as I could for 50 minutes. And you can just imagine, I could have preached all, all summer on the book of Luke, or excuse me, on the book of Romans. Just think of what uh, happens with Luke. It's even longer than the book of Romans. But we're going to talk about some things tonight, hopefully, that will be encouraging to you. I, I really appreciate and hope that you'll allow me just a moment to say this. Uh, the book of Matthew, 
Matthew was written to the Jews, and, and it really was writing about the kingdom of Christ, and, and that was the focus of the book. And Mark, Mark wrote to the Romans, and he talked about the power and the majesty of Jesus. Luke wrote to the Greeks, and he wrote to them about the idea of man being Jesus Christ. The, the Greeks were a little bit different folk, and uh, if you've studied the Gospels, you know that Luke writes. He's a physician. He writes in more detail. He writes uh, really concerning some things that uh, uh, we'll talk about in just a moment. Uh, as far as their focus in, in Acts, uh, excuse me, Luke chapter 2, you might remember verse 52, it talks about the fact how Jesus grew. And as he writes this, these are the things that the, the Greeks were interested in. He talked to them about the social and the physical and the mental and the spiritual value that Jesus brought. And you might remember that passage talks about him growing up and this is how he uh, discusses it. The book of John was written to all mankind, and it's written about the deity of Jesus. And uh, what a great uh, book it'll be. You'll have someone coming next week that'll be talking about that. The book of Luke is interesting in so much that uh, we know that uh, Paul uh, did a lot of writing. He would always name who it was writing and who he was writing to. Luke does very much the same thing. In chapter 1, verse 1, if you have your Bibles, open them with me. Uh, we'll be talking about the scriptures from the book of Luke uh, this evening. He says, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which were most surely believed among us, even as they delivered unto them, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very uh, first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. If you're familiar with the book of Acts, you know that he comes right along and he addresses the book of Acts to Theophilus. And the book of Acts picks right up where the book of Luke ends. And we can appreciate the way that he discusses uh, the scriptures I know that uh, it's interesting as you read through the Gospels, the, the different things that are repeated by these authors. And Luke gives greater detail to, in a lot of respects to what he's saying. I really enjoy chapter 2 where he, uh, of course, is talking about Jesus and his coming. And as you think about this, just think for a moment about uh, the birth of Jesus the way he makes the declaration, the way he makes the, the uh, gospel come alive. And, and he talks here, if you will look at chapter 2 with me. He begins, he says, It came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And you might remember how that Joseph, Joseph who went up from Galilee, he went, uh, of course, out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David. We've been talking about the book of Isaiah, the gospel according to Isaiah. And it's amazing the number of accounts, the number of scriptures that are quoted from the book of Isaiah. You might remember that the Old Testament actually talks to us about uh, where Jesus was going to be born. Many uh, would have thought that the king of the Jews would have been born in Jerusalem. But the Old Testament reminds us that he was going to be born not in Jerusalem, but in Bethlehem. And, of course, that's fulfilled. And chapter 2 does a wonderful job of uh, explaining about that. He talks and he tells us in verse 4, Joseph also went up from Galilee, the city of Nazareth, to Judea. Notice verse 5 tells us to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that when they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in the manger because there was no room for them in the end. No, have you ever thought about the announcement of the birth of Jesus? He tells us here in verse 8 that there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. You know, the world 
has taken the date of December 25th as being the birth date of Jesus. But Luke pretty well refutes that when he talks about the shepherds being in the fields with their sheep at night. That, this throng season, it doesn't happen even in Judea in December. We've just come through perhaps the time of the year when the birth of Jesus would actually have taken place. That would be the springtime that we have here and that's when the shepherds would take their, feet, their sheep and go to the hills and they would stay with them there as the newborn, as the new grass began to grow and they would feed their flocks. But he reminds us that uh, these men, these shepherds were out there and it tells us in verse 9, the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. You shall find, and in, in, there shall be a sign unto you, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in the manger. It's interesting how he describes and tells these farmers, these shepherds, what they would find. They would find the baby not uh, in the inn, but in a manger. He would be wrapped in swaddling clothes. Have you ever thought about this? The swaddling clothes that the baby Jesus was wrapped in was the same type of material that they used to prepare his body for burial. He came into the world wrapped in swaddling clothes. And before his resurrection, he was wrapped in those swaddling clothes in the grave. But just go ahead and look and understand. It tells us in verse 13 that there was a, with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host. They were praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. I would probably have been afraid if I had been there too. Out in the field at night, angels appear. We don't know. Uh, there's no account that they had ever had angels come and appear to them before, but these people came, these messengers of God, these servants came and told those men that there was a king born that night. And after they left, listen, it tells us that uh, it came to pass that the angels were gone from them to heaven. The shepherds said one to another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass which the Lord hath made known to us. You talk about good news. They might have been afraid in the beginning, but once they heard the explanation, they were excited. They were willing to leave their sheep in the fields to go find this king of the Jews. They, they were willing to, to make that trip. And it tells us in verse 16, they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they had made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all that heard it wondered at these things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things. Listen and pondered them in her heart. Mothers, I really appreciate Jane bringing me some pictures of uh, little Oliver. Folk in Hiawassee have adopted him. I, I know he's here with you, or will be shortly. And, uh, but all those uh, weeks and <laughs> even the last few months when he's been in the hospital, I know he was on our prayer list and uh, of course his great grandmother was there with us for a long time. And, uh, it's, uh, it's a joy to see our prayers answered. But mothers, I know you well enough. What do you do? Some of the greatest memories that you have are of your babies. And Mary kept all these things in her heart and she pondered them. You know, we can uh, remember that as Jesus grew, verse 52 tells us, and it's that passage I made reference to just a moment ago. Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. No, we uh, need to have balance in our lives. And I hope that you as parents and grandparents would, would try to help your children to have balance, that you would help them, that they would want to grow socially and, and physically, mentally, and, and above all spiritually. And just think about the joy that uh, Jesus brought 
to his family, to his mother and to Joseph, his earthly father. You might remember how that in this third chapter it has the genealogy of Jesus and it's the genealogy of Joseph. Matthew records the genealogy of Mary and both were the house of David. And we can see that uh, he certainly made a difference in, in the way that all things were happening. We can talk about a lot of different things in the life of Jesus. Time won't allow us to do the whole book, but I want you to turn with me over to the 15th chapter. I really believe there are some teachings that, that Luke records for us that we can appreciate a great deal. And I believe that the 15th chapter of Luke is one of those passages that we as Christians can look at and can appreciate. He told parables. And I don't know about you, but uh, I can tell you, having grown up in the church and, and having preached for 49 years, the fact that many people will remember illustrations. They'll remember stories even before they remember a, a particular scripture you might have mentioned or quoted in a lesson. Jesus knew that. He understood and he talked in a way that these people could understand. And just think, it tells us in verse 1, Then drew near to him all the publicans and sinners were to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Where should he have gone? You know, we as Christians today have uh, the opportunity to share the gospel with our family and friends. And... You know, Jesus reminded us that, uh, you know, if we, if we stay with people that, uh, well, people that love us, we've not really had the opportunity to, to grow. And, and we need to, to certainly reach out and, and try to bring family and friends into the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I remember going through a personal work class many, many years ago with Brother Ivan Stewart. And one of the things he said is that you don't convert strangers, you convert friends. And we've all got influence. We've all got people in our lives that would listen to us and talk with us about the gospel. And, and, and folk, we need to be making friends. Uh, several years ago, they, we heard the term friendship evangelism. I can tell you that we shied away from that because it was misused in some cases. But really, that's where we need to have our growth today. The Lord's church is is suffering because of COVID. You think about what's happened. Uh, there's people that uh, have not come back to the building. They've not been tuning in and, and watching on Facebook. They're, they're, they're missing an action. And we need to do all that we can to help them. Jesus really was reaching out to the publicans and sinners. And who should we be reaching out to? He gave parables. The first parable that he spake concerned the man, and I'm going to paraphrase here, he had a hundred sheep, one of them went missing. And he goes, he leaves the ninety and nine, and he goes out and, and he finds that one. And just look at the beauty of what he's saying to them. In verse 6, it tells us, When he cometh home, he called them together, his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep which was lost. And I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety-nine just persons which need no repentance. Oh, the second parable that he gave in here was about a lady who had ten coins and she lost one of them. Have you ever misplaced something that uh, of value? It tells us that she swept her house until she found it. And when she found that missing coin, it tells us that she called her friends, her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I would lost. And likewise, I say unto you, there's joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Oh, what a great, great parable. But let me tell you, I really believe the greatest parable that I can find in the Bible is found here in Luke 15, beginning verse 11. It's the parable of the prodigal son. And the reason I say that, I really believe that every person, every person alive can identify 
with what Jesus is saying in this parable. If you're here and you're a child of God, you can look back and you can remember where you were before you obeyed the gospel. If you're here tonight and you've never obeyed the gospel, let me say to you, that prodigal son was away from home. We're going to share these passages in just a moment, but let me say to you, the Lord wants you to come home. And listen to Jesus. A certain had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided to them his living. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, took his journey into a far country, and there wasted the substance with righteous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. He went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, And he sent him into the fields to feed swine. He would faint have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, but no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough in despair, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father. I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before thee. I'm no more worthy to be called thy son, but make me as one of thy hired servants. He arose and came to his father. And yet when he was a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. He said to his son, his son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight. I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. It's interesting how that uh, the younger son came and he said, Father, give me. Give me my inheritance. And the father did. He took that inheritance and he left home. How many of you remember leaving home for the first time? Boy, I'll tell you, I can, it's been a long time ago, but I can still recall what it was like. I had a 1966 green Volkswagen. I'd loaded it with everything I had and I headed to Montgomery. It was the end of September And many of you know that in the mountains especially, by the end of September, the dogwoods are kind of turning, the shoemates turning red, and and the mornings are cool, and you'd feel fall in the air. And the day I got to Montgomery, it was 100 degrees. And it stayed over 100 for five consecutive days before it ever cooled down below 100. I don't know about you, but having been raised in the mountains, Driving down to Montgomery on 85, uh, maybe through Opelika and on into Montgomery, it's flat. And it looks swampy. There's those beaver, beaver fields, beaver dams that have been built, and it, it just looks so flat and, and swampy. And I was homesick before I ever got there. They don't know how lucky they were that I stayed. I had a roommate from up in North Alabama, and one day he came in. He said, Butch, I found you a mountain. Up above Montgomery, uh, 231, I believe, is the highway number. It goes to Wetumpka, and there's a little bump, a little hill up there, and believe it or not, it's called Blue Ridge. I'd go up there and sit in the evening and watch the sunset. So homesick for these mountains of Georgia. That young man left home, and it tells us that he wasted his inheritance. He had friends. As long as he had money, he had friends. But when the money ran out, so did the friends. He took a job, and the only job that maybe he could find was feeding the swine, feeding hogs. We used to call it slopping the hogs. You know, a hog will eat anything. And his job was to take the husk, the the grain, and to feed those hogs. And it says he would have eaten if only somebody had given it to him. Notice it tells us something. He came to himself and he said, My father's servants have bread enough 
and despair, and here I starve. You ever been hungry? A few times I've been hungry, but I can't identify with what he must have been feeling. But it tells us that he came to himself. What about, what about your life? Can you look back and remember what it was like before you became a Christian? I remember praying a lot of times, Lord, don't come, I'm not ready. But I remember a preacher coming to our house on a cold October Thursday evening, rain, drizzle in the air, and he asked me, he said, Butch, I know that you understand the gospel, you understand what the word says you need to do, are you not ready? And I'd fought it long enough. Never will forget, he asked me, he said, is there anybody you want to be there? There was a a gentleman by the name of Lewis Ralston who taught the teenage class at Blue Ridge. Lewis Ralston was the only person, the only person that had ever talked to me about my obeying the gospel. I told the preacher, yeah, I'd love for Brother Lewis Ralston to be there. Well, Brother Ralston was an older gentleman. He went to bed with the chickens, and it was after dark. Preacher called and he said, I'll be there. He got out of bed, drove to the church building in Blue Ridge. He was there when I was baptized. I appreciated him. I loved him for what he had done, encouraging me. You know, all of us probably remember those individuals that meant so much to us. This young man came to himself. It tells us that he came home. That began his journey. He came home. Oh, he said, I'm going to go back and I'm going to tell my daddy I'm not worthy to be called your son. I've sinned and I've wasted my inheritance. I'm not worthy to be called your son, but just make me as one of your hired servants. You know, I love the picture here. If any of you ever heard uh, Brother Charlie Hodge, Charlie Hodge had a sermon entitled, Will God Run? You see, it tells us here that when he was a great way off, his father saw him. And what did he do? I thought about how many times maybe that father had gone out to the edge of the property or maybe the edge of the yard or whatever it be and look off into the way his son left and wonder where his son's at. And that night, that evening, he looked and there was someone coming clothes didn't look like his son he left with good clothes he's coming back with clothes he wore in the pig pen he was a lot thinner he was hungry but yet it looked like his son and he ran to him he had compassion on him and he fell on his neck he kissed him and he said the son said to him father I've sinned against heaven in thy sight and I'm no more ready to be called thy son but the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put on him and, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. His father restored him back to where he should have been in the family. Oh, sure, he'd wasted his inheritance. He'd left home. He'd done a lot of things that weren't right. But the father welcomed him back home. Let me just tell you, I know there's people that say, well, preacher, you just don't know what I've done. You just don't know what I've got in my past and I don't know how God can forgive me. He can. He will. And he wants to. Oh, he told them to kill the fatted calf and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead. He's alive again. He was lost and now he's found. What a beautiful, beautiful picture. And that's the reason I say that I believe every soul can look at Luke 15 and they can see themselves in the story, the, the, the parable of the prodigal son. It wasn't just about one being away. But you might remember how it tells us that, verse 25, his elder son was in the field. And he came and drew nigh to the house and he heard music and dancing and he called one of the servants and said, what, what do these things mean? And he said, thy brother has come and the father hath killed the fatted calf because he hath received him safe and, and sound. The older brother couldn't stand it. He was angry. 
He would not go in, and therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time the mammoth, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, that which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said to him, Son, all that, that thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. You know, it's sad. It tells us in verse 32, It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. We don't ever find, and Jesus stops there, he doesn't tell us that the older brother ever went in to welcome his brother home. The Pharisees was who Jesus was talking to. The Jews. There are over 800 references to the coming Messiah in the Old Testament. 800. If you read the book of Isaiah alone, there's dozens and dozens, hundreds of references to a Savior to, to Jesus coming. And why was it that these people rejected Jesus? Why was it? You know, the sad thing is, there's a lot of Pharisees in our world today. And we need to be very cautious and careful that we not be like this elder brother. But when those people... When those people obey the gospel that have been out here in the world and have a past, we need to forgive them when we can. We need to make sure that we welcome them home. I never will forget there was a preacher many years ago who preached over in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. His name was Kenneth Reed. I heard Brother Kenneth Reed stand up and he said in a chapel speech at, at Alabama Christian years ago, he said, you know, I stood before an alcoholic and a drug user. I stood before a prostitute. I stood between before an adulterer. And he said, lest you think I was in the slums, let me tell you, I was standing before a Bible class in the Lord's church. Paul said, and such were some of you. We've all got a past, but we can be thankful that God helps us get beyond that past. And let me just tell you, you can either rejoice because you've been the prodigal and you've come home, or if you're still the prodigal and away from home, heed what he's telling you. Come home while there's time. The 16th chapter of Luke follows right along as far as being an important chapter. He talks about a rich man and he talks about, well, it's interesting how that he says there is a certain rich man. We're not going to have time to look at the parable of the of the rich man here. But I just want to remind you that I do think there's a very, very important lesson taught here. And it begins with the 14th chapter, uh, the, excuse me, the 14th verse of this chapter, the 16th chapter. And I, I want us to touch on this, and I want you to think about it just for a moment. Oh, I, I said 14. We're actually going to begin with verse 19. You see, in verse 14, it tells us the Pharisees also who were covetous heard all these things and they deriled him. You know what that means? They despised Jesus because he was telling the truth. They didn't like what he was having to say. And folk, y'all know what persecution is. Because when you stand for the truth, there are going to be people that don't like it. They don't like you. But it didn't stop Jesus. And it can't stop us. Peter tells us he's left us an example that we should follow in his steps. Oh, our prayers have been with you. And I'm thankful for the family here. I'm thankful for the shepherds. I'm thankful for you. That you stand behind them and you hold up their hand and that you do that which is right. Beginning verse 19, Jesus said there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and he fared sumptuously every day. And then there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which laid at the gate full of sores. 
He desired to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by his angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. Let me just remind all of us that Hebrews 9 tells us that it is appointed man once to die and then cometh the judgment. We've all got an appointment with death. And the only thing that's going to keep us from facing death here in this world is to be alive when Jesus comes back. Paul addresses that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 if you want to go home and read it tonight. But let me just tell you, this rich man who thought he had it made, who was not only rich, but he fared sumptuously. I think that shows extravagance. He was He was wealthy. You know, sometimes when we live poor, we think, oh, if there were just, just enough money, it would, sure would help us. But some of the most miserable people I know are people who have wealth. They can't enjoy life for worrying about it being gone. And if what they have, they want just a little bit more. And they're truly miserable. The story tells us, and let me just say to you, I don't really think that he's giving a parable here. I think he's talking about an incident that happened. Somebody says, well, why would you think that? He said there was a certain rich man, and then there was a man named Lazarus. Jesus in his parables didn't do that anywhere else in the gospel accounts. He named Lazarus. And he said that Lazarus died, and he was carried by the angels to the bosom of Abraham. What a, what a beautiful thing it is when a child of God leaves this world. Even the Old Testament makes the statement that precious in the sight of Jehovah is the death of his saints. So I look out tonight, I miss some people. Some people not here. Friends, brothers, sisters. And folks, let me just tell you, they've left us behind. We don't worry about them. We worry about each other. The rich man died and he was buried. It tells us here in verse 23 that he lifted up his eyes in torments and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father, Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I'm tormented in this flame. But Abraham said to him, Son, remember thou in thy lifetime receivest thou good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. And now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And beside all this between us and you there's a great gut fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. And then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Think about Jesus saying this. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And the rich man said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went into them from the dead, they will repent. Abraham said to him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. I don't know about you. Have you ever heard a lesson on hell that actually was so factual that you could feel heat? Brother Jimmy Allen came to Cleveland, Tennessee when I was just a teenager, and I remember we went. It was at the Bradley County High School. There was no air conditioning in an old gym. It was about the end of July, 1st of August. And Jimmy Allen preached a sermon on what is hell like. It was so hot, I thought I felt it. Probably some of you have been there. You know what I'm talking about. Lazarus had a tough time here. He was a sick man. He was a hungry man. 
Even the dogs came and licked his sores. He just wanted the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. But then eternity began. Folks, let me tell you something. We're all going to have to stand before the judgment throne of God and we're going to have to give an account. And just think about what we're going to hear if we're faithful to Him. If we're one of His family, if we've been living for Him. You know, I, I can just hear Jesus say, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. But how sad it is to think He's going to say to some, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. Luke goes in great detail about some things, and there are so many more things we could talk about. I really appreciate the fact that Luke records for us and tells us a great deal about the trial of Jesus. Though I, I look back and I think about many of the scriptures and what they mean to us, turn with me over to chapter 22. I want us to touch on this. It was the night Jesus was betrayed. It was the night that, well, one of his very own Judas sold him out for a price. He sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Do you know that was the price of a slave, a common slave? And Judas sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Oh, how sad it is. You think about what takes place here. In verse 48, you might remember that they're coming out of the Garden of Gethsemane. The mob's meeting them. Remember when he woke up Peter, James, and John, he told them we have to be going, they're coming. He knew what was happening. He knew what was going to transpire. And when they came to him, verse 47, it tells us, while he spake, behold, a multitude and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? When they which were about saw what would follow, they said to him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye not. Suffer ye thus far. And he touched his ear. He healed him. And then Jesus said to the chief priests and the captains and the, the temple and the elders which were come to him, But ye come out as a thief with swords and staves. And when I was daily within the temple, ye stretched forth no hands against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. And verse 54 tells us they took him and they led him and they brought him to the high priest's house and Peter followed afar off. If you go back and look, Peter had told the Lord, Lord, I'll go with you all the way. And Jesus told Peter, said, Peter, you're going to deny me. And you're going to deny me not once, but three times before the cock crows. Do you think that Peter ever heard a rooster crow that he didn't think of what Jesus said to him? Do you think he ever, ever heard a rooster and not remember what he did denying Jesus. Oh, but you know, it's a sad thing. Peter, when he heard that cock crow, that rooster crow, it tells us he went out and he wept bitterly. He realized what he'd done. Folks, there are times in our life that we make mistakes when we make bad choices. And we're not going to necessarily hear a rooster crow, but I would only hope that when you realize you've made the mistake that you won't stay in that mistake we need to all be willing to come back and to make our lives right first on one tells us we say we just, that we sin not that we don't sin we make him a liar and his truth's not in us we've got to realize that yes we're going to make mistakes along the way God just he doesn't want us to stay in the mistake he doesn't want us to keep doing those things that are wrong and he'll forgive us. First John 1 tells us if we confess our sins to him, he's faithful and just to forgive us of those sins. And we need to believe in the power of prayer. You know the power of prayer. You're a praying church. And I would only hope that you would continue praying for those that are preaching the gospel. I pray that you'll pray for your shepherds, that you'll keep going. 
You know, we don't have time to talk about the crucifixion scene. I'd only beg you to go back and look at chapters 23 and 24. Oh, what a sad day it was. When Jesus died on the cross, when he said finished, I really think the devil and his crowd thought they had won a victory. I believe there was probably a, a, a party in hell because the Son of God died on Calvary's cross. But you know, think about what happened on the first day of the week. Chapter 24 begins. Upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the sepulchre abroad, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain, certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away. And they entered and found not the body of Jesus. And it came to pass as they were much perplexed there about two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said to him, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here. He's risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered to the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. I like verse 8. And they remembered his words. They returned from the sepulcher, told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Oh. Tells us Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary, the mother of James, and other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. I love that song because he lives. Because Jesus came out of that grave. The victory that the devil thought he'd won on Friday, he lost on Sunday morning because Jesus came out of that grave. Why are you seeking the living among the dead? You should remember he told you that he wouldn't be here. Oh, I just hope that we would remember how important it is that Jesus lives. Because he lives, we can see tomorrow. I would only ask you to think about the importance of the gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I know you've had lessons on Matthew and Mark, and I know that they've been very touching, and I know they've been very important. Luke gives a little bit more detail. He's the physician. He's talking to the Greeks, and he gives just a little bit more information in regard to things. John, the 20th chapter, reminds us that all, not all things Jesus did are written, but these things are written that you might believe and that believing might have life in his name. That's a wonderful thing. Think of what would happen if we knew all that Jesus did while he was here in his ministry. But brethren, we've got enough. The Bible tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing with the word of God. We need to have faith. Hebrews 11 tells us without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And we need to have a faith that moves us. That moves us to change our lives, to repent. And that we obey his command to have our sins washed away. Oh, Matthew, Mark do a wonderful job of sharing that great commission going to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Baptism. Baptism is a beautiful thing that God's given to us. You must be born again. Just think about Romans 6. Paul tells us that we died of sin, we're buried with Christ, and just as he was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we're raised to walk in newness of life. If you've never done that, I hope something we said tonight might, might actually cause you to look and to understand. God wants you to be saved. Sure, it was important for that shepherd that he went out on the hill and he found that one, one sheep that was stray. And even the angels rejoice. Think about that woman who lost her one coin. And she called her family and friends together and they rejoiced. Angels in heaven rejoice when one sinner makes his life right. Think about the prodigal son and where you are. Are you home, back with the father? If you're not, hope you'll think about it. God wants you home. 
will God run? He ran to that son. Yes, he had been in the far off land of sin. He had wasted his inheritance. He'd spent it on, well, sinful living. The older brother reminded his father he'd spent it on harlots. He'd done a lot of things he should have been ashamed of. But he came home, and the father welcomed him. Hope we've said something tonight to encourage you. The book of Luke is precious. I hope that you will enjoy studying it more through the years. And just know it has a lot of hope for us that are part of God's family. Bow with me in this closing prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the privilege of coming together tonight, of talking about your word, of looking at some parables and some examples, Father, that really can make a difference in our lives in the lives of all mankind. Father, help us that we be willing to take the gospel to those who need it. Help us not to be like the rich man and to overlook those who have needs and, Father, that might be hurting this world because, Father, one day we know we're going to have to die. We're going to have to meet you. Help us to be ready. We ask you to continue to bless this family here at Woodstock. Be with Brother Amos, as he preaches the word, be with these shepherds as they feed the flock. And Father, we pray you'll be with the deacons that serve in every family. Help us to bear one another's burdens and fulfill your word. And Father, above all, we give thanks for our family, our friends, for your family, and especially for your son Jesus. In his name we ask you, amen. I've enjoyed being with you. Hope you'll come up to Hiawassee and see me. We have Bible study at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning and our worship is at 11 and we do, we'll treat you every which way you can think of just to come. I need to say a special thank you to Keith Taylor. Keith brought some folk up, uh, uh, it was a year or so ago and, and had a service when I had to be out of town and you've been, you supported the work in Hiawassee in so many ways in years past. Just keep us in your prayers. Come see us when you can and know that we love you and we appreciate you. It's great to be with you tonight.